Thank you very much for coming back from lunch. Hope <laughs> you uh, uh, had a had a nice break. Um, and once again, thank you, Dennis. I think he's already outside for uh, for the entrepreneurial boot camp. It was very very interesting. Uh, what we're going to do now is hold a panel uh, with uh, four of these. Um, uh, Fine individuals who are, who are uh, nice enough to, to come today and share their experience with non dilutive funding, non dilutive funding sources, how they went about uh, securing funding, and what sort of impact it had on their organization. Uh, so, the way we're going to do it is just going to have each one present to you um, about the company and, uh, and about the non dilutive angle aspect to, uh, to what they've done uh, by, by way of introduction. Uh, so we've got Dan Burnett from Theranova all the way in the end. And when they come up, they will uh, 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 share more about uh, their, their uh, um, um, expertise, et cetera. Uh, we've got Pablo, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot your last name, uh, Viloslada, right, uh, from Bionor. Uh, that's a, a Spanish company, just recently moved uh, out here to the Bay Area. Uh, we've also got uh, Michael Allen from Embolix. And finally, Megan Norwell from uh, NanoMR over here. And uh, um, right now, I'll, I'll allow uh, uh, Michael to, uh, to start with his presentation. And uh, thank you very much, please. OK, so um, my name is Michael Allen. I'm the CEO of a company called uh, Embolix. And um, first of all, I want to say that I'm here for you to share my experiences uh, in getting non-dilutive uh, financing from the federal government. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur here in Silicon Valley. Um, this is my fourth company. Um, I've gotten uh, about uh, six phase one grants and three phase two SBIR grants. Uh, and we were just uh, able to, uh, to get in a phase one STTR. Um, Embolix is a startup company, a small uh, company. We um, are a semi-virtual company uh, in that we have R&D and marketing in-house, um, but um, everything else is, is outsourced. Um, I um, was in a position a couple of years ago where I was looking for something new. Um, and as the way it happens a lot of the times, um, I was in a Starbucks and I met a friend who was a physician. Uh, and the physician said, you know, you ought to go look at this uh, type of cancer therapy. It's been around for a long time, but, um, and it should have stellar performance, but it doesn't. And no one really knows why. So um, I took his advice and I found that tumor embolization had been around for 50 years. And um, it had been done uh, from a clinical perspective exactly the same uh, for its entire 50 years of, of existence. And the um, technique was fairly clear as to how it, it, it works and how it should work. Um, and it's essentially using a catheter to uh, navigate from an external part of your body through an arteries into a vicinity of a tumor and then filling it with microparticles and, uh, the, and that elute drug. And two things happen. The first thing is that you choke the tumor because the particles embolize the tumor. There's no more blood flow, so it has no more oxygen. And the second thing that happens is that uh, high concentrations of chemo agent are put into the tumor about 10 times what um, you see in a systemic chemotherapy. Uh, and the other great thing about this is that there's very low toxicity. All of the chemo agent is confined to the tumor. All the things that we think of about embolization, or excuse me, standard chemo therapy, like losing your hair or getting sick, don't occur. So it, um, it uh, is a very uh, good procedure. And I agreed with my friend, and it should have very good uh, efficacy. Um, however, what I found was it was very inconsistent. But there are studies that show stellar efficacy. There are controlled clinical trials that uh, demonstrate uh, the clinical efficacy. However, all the studies don't show the same thing. So there are others that are, that are contrary. And oncologists uh, look at this 
um, as uh, a procedure that's, that's inconsistent. And so as far as referrals, um, they do refer patients. There's about 300,000 procedures done per year, but there could be many more. And the truth of the matter is, is no one really knows why. And so what my friend said was, if you could find out why, there may be an opportunity. And so we started looking at this. And um, we first began to look at, well, how, what happens? How does this work? And um, um, this <coughs> diagram shows uh, essentially an artery leading to a tumor and a, and a standard microcatheter. And uh, the way it's been done for 50 years is um, the uh, catheter is put in the vicinity of the tumor and uh, uh, microparticles are infused. And in a perfect world, all the microparticles go into the tumor. We looked at the literature. We looked at fluid dynamics, computational models. We looked at solid models. We looked at animal studies. And I'll tell you that that's not what's happening. Um, there are branch arteries that are distal to the tumor. And the blood is flowing in the direction of those arteries and out those arteries. And what happens is uh, an inconsistent uh, flow of particles either into the tumor or down out these uh, distal uh, arteries that uh, produce non-target uh, target flow. And um, in the literature, you don't hear about this. And so once we figured out what was going on, um, through this model, we realized that uh, there was a, a wide variation in uh, how the tumor was uh, receiving these particles, including a possibility that no particles go into the tumor, so an enormous range. And this was consistent with the observations in the clinical studies that had been done. So now that we knew what, what um, was happening, the question was, what do we do about it? And so we got seed financing, which is how we found the, um, the uh, model. And, uh, and then we got an STTR grant, and we started to find out how we were going to solve the problem. And we went down a lot of paths that weren't uh, fruitful. Um, but then what we realized was if we control the blood pressure at the tip of the catheter so that we can reduce the pressure by about 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury in the vicinity of the tumor, what happened was we eliminated the non-target flow. And in fact, all the flow was uh, focused in, into the tumor. And there was a good reason for this, because when we uh, lowered the, the pressure, uh, the arteries that uh, were not, uh, not leading into the tumor reversed flow. So we thought we understood this. And then the question was, well, how do we do that? And so with the STTR grant, we started developing a uh, system to do this. It's uh, shown there. Uh, it is a microcatheter, so you can imagine the challenge in this. It's less than a millimeter in diameter. And um, we uh, placed a device to reduce uh, blood pressure uh, on, on the tip. So. So um, we feel, um, and it's fairly clear, that if we are able to get this to work, this is a uh, breakthrough. And we believe it will be used for uh, many uh, different tumors. So then it came to raising money. We had a good idea. And uh, in my previous companies, I've always used a standard model. I went to VCs on Sand Hill Road, and I know most of them. Um, but what I found out, different from when I started my previous medical device company, uh, there are investment cycles. And it turned out that medical devices right now are pretty close to the bottom of the investment cycle. And uh, valuations are about four times less. And of course, this posed a problem. In my former company and the companies before that, I raised $6.1 million in a Series A financing and what I had was a couple of patents and a prototype that I made in the garage. But that was not going to happen in this case for two reasons. One of them is there was not a lot of venture capital that was interested in funding early stage medical devices. But second, we didn't want to do that. We wouldn't do that because the valuations were low and we'd be diluted to a point that it wouldn't be worth us uh, uh, taking the time to do this. So um, we're entrepreneurs. Uh, give us a problem. We'll figure out how to solve it. So 
started looking at different uh, financing and um, looked at what, what I call non-traditional. Uh, and what that means is you get very little <coughs> capital, you work very hard, and the capital that you get comes in small, small parts. So um, we also had to figure out a uh, funding uh, strategy. And the funding strategy is fundamentally based on limiting dilution. And um, first of all, where do we get capital? And the answer was not the VCs that I was used to getting the capital from. It was ourselves. It was angels. It was friends, families. Small VCs fit into this category because they are also are vulnerable to uh, dilution. And then probably the best kind of funding uh, in this scenario are grants because they're uh, completely non-dilutive. Non so that was part of our, our strategy. Um, the second thing was we realized that we had to raise money, not in big clumps like I was used to, but incrementally. Because what we wanted to do was we wanted to build values going, going along and uh, get less dilution. And probably the most difficult thing was realizing we had to be able to exit with a very low amount of paid-in equity capital. Uh, because if we didn't do this, the initial investors and the founders, again, would be, be diluted out. So our strategy was to, to leverage. So get seed financing. We had an initial seed financing. And with that, we determined the model that I showed you. And then we got an STTR grant during that period. And with that, we started developing the device. And then from the information that we gained uh, through the seed and the STTR, which we're still, um, we're still uh, under that uh, uh, first period, um, we were able to um, close a Series A, which we closed in November. And uh, then we applied for another grant. And so the process that we came up with is to use equity financing and grants to move through a process where um, we would uh, minimize dilution. So um, as far as a grant strategy, our goal, so we put a plan together. We put a budget together. And we realized that we would need seven to ten million dollars in order to get the company commercial uh, and uh, get uh, to uh, being um, uh, acquisition ready. And um, so the idea was grants, obviously, that made sense. We're working with Free Minds right now. They're the ones that told us what grants that we were appropriate for us to apply for. And the first one we applied for was an STTR, and we have the phase one. And there's also phase two. And um, then the next grant that we just filed uh, for was an SBIR. And the STTR and the SBIR have about the similar amounts of funding when you, when you uh, uh, put together the phase one and phase two, and it's significant. And the total potential of what we're applying for is about $4 million. So in a uh, plan where you're raising $10 million total, so you would have $8 million of equity capital, $4 million or even $2 million is very significant. So so there are positive and negatives, however, for getting grants. Um, I, didn't, I didn't go after grants in every company that, that, I, uh, that I started. Um, this particular company, it makes sense, but others, it didn't make sense. So, but there are a lot of positives. Um, the first positive uh, is probably the most obvious, and that is it's non-dilutive. So um, it, it, uh, it helps the investors. It helps the, uh, the people that are in the company. Uh, the second thing, um, which is probably just as valuable, is there's a lot of very smart people in the NIH or the National Science Foundation that are looking at these things, and so they do a lot of diligence. And that provides credibility. And um, it also um, ends up detracting investors. And so we're not talking about big VCs, but it attracts especially small investors that are very dilution uh, sensitive 
but they also don't have the broad resources to do all of the um, diligence as far as, uh, in particular, the scientific aspects. Um, and one of the, th the, the biggest things, I think, is that it provides less dilution in your equity rounds that follow the grant. And I'll tell you that, that when we did our Series A, we um, prevented or, 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 or had less dilution than uh, was the entire value of the Phase I grant. <clears throat> so the strategy of, of, of uh, getting grants and then doing equity financing uh, is, is a way to um, reduce dilution. Uh, it also reduces risk. It's not only risk in financing that I just talked about, but it's also uh, reducing risk uh, over the long term because you essentially have a stream of money where you're making constant improvements and if there's times where you cannot raise equity financing it'll be a bridge um, to, um, to uh, get enough accomplished so that you can uh, get equity financing. Um, and nothing's certain uh, but as many of you probably know equity financing is not easy. Um, and uh, and grants, however, uh, while they're not easy either, if you have a good idea, like the one that I showed you, and you're able to write a good grant, you have a pretty good chance uh, of getting uh, this, this type of funding. Um, some of the things that you need to know, and some of the perhaps difficulties and challenges is, if you make a decision in your funding strategy to include grants, you have to realize that it takes a lot of work. One of the initial investors uh, in my recent company, uh, who is an angel, a high net worth individual, and um, when we received, when I got the first, first grant, the STTR, he said, wow, free money. And what I'll tell you, it's not free money. It's a tremendous amount of commitment that you need to put into this in order to make it work. Now, even if you get help, in, in, in the grants, which I suggest you do, um, you still have to write the grant. And as part of the grant, you have to have a very detailed uh, technical plan, more detailed than you would normally do if you were not getting a grant. You have to think out 12 months, even what materials you're going to buy. So it takes a lot of research. Uh, along with that, you need a budget. Um, if you have an STTR, it's essentially a collaboration with the university. We have a collaboration with UC San Diego. You have to have a legal contract. So you have to work with their legal departments and, and any uh, other types of arrangements that you need with the organization. Um, you need letters from your customers. In our cases, it was doctors. And you're just starting a company. So you didn't even know any of your customers. So you have to go out and you have to uh, get to know them and get them to uh, write reference letters. Not just the technology sounds great, um, I think it's a good idea, but I'm going to buy it. So you're, you're uh, showing that you do have something that's viable uh, from a co commercial point of view. Um, and then, once you get the grant, you have to provide regular updates. And I'll tell you, 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 you do a a uh, thorough job and um, to, of figuring out, well, what do you do in your aims through the project? But what I'll tell you is that's not right. You end, end up, how can you predict a year later? You're, you, you have a lot of it correct, but not all of it. So regular communication with your director, you're changing things. Um, uh, sometimes you have to provide your own uh, capital that you got from equity to do things that you didn't uh, anticipate, but you have to work your way through that. Um, I think another thing that's important to, to think about, to see if does this fit into your, uh, your strategic plan of your company, and that is these grants are, are a long term, that their time horizon uh, is, is very long, uh, it's years. So think about the STTR grant. It takes six months, roughly, initially, so by the time you apply for it, um, and it gets reviewed, then you uh, you have the first phase, it's 12 months. And then there's a space between phase one and phase two, and then it's an 18 months. So this is three years. 
So does that fit into your, uh, into your plan? Uh, in our case, it did. Uh, and so uh, one of the re in this particular company, why it, it uh, fit in. So finally, um, some, some ideas as to um, how to, uh, to best uh, achieve um, funding from the federal government. Um, so this is not a weekend project. It's not something that you can do in evenings. It has to make it a priority. And for me, we, I put this plan together. We had technical milestones. We had milestones with the customers, research. We also had miles of funding. So this was milestone. So, so we made it a priority. Uh, and uh, in, in making it a priority, you need to have someone in the company that's knowledgeable, that can write the grants, that can do the research to understand how you're going to project this forward over 12 months. Um, the biggest thing, the most important, in my experience with grants, is that you need to, uh, to write a very clear grant. It needs to be thoughtful. It needs to be thorough. Think about it from the eyes of the reviewer. The reviewer picks this up. They never don't know what you're doing. And so you need to be able to explain it to them, why it's important, in a very clear, understandable way. You need to understand what the market is. You need to understand what the technical object, uh, objects, objectives are. And you also um, need to have input from customers. So um, another thing is, so initially, you, 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 your funding is from the NIH, or the National Science Foundation. And I know I think of them as more academic, research-oriented, but they don't fund research projects. These grants are meant to get companies off the ground that are commercial, that are going commercial. So that's what our company was. We were doing this for an investment reason. We want to put products on the market. And, um, and so uh, that fit into the uh, criteria. Um, there has to be commercial value. In fact, even in the phase one, you have to have a commercial plan. You have to understand how you're going to get, uh, get to market. Um, and then uh, final point is that I would recommend that if you were going to do this, uh, that you get help doing it. Um, I've, through, through the past, have used uh, consultants here in Silicon Valley to try to help their uh, marginal, uh, marginal use, I found. Um, but there are a lot of things in, uh, in filing a grant. Yes, you're going to have to write it and put the budget together. But there are, that's about half of it. But there are many, many other things. For example, in, in filing the Phase 1 STTR and the Phase 1 SBR, which we did, there are six government websites that you have to deal with. And I will tell you, I am still totally confused about how to interact with these. Because not only or they utilize, use for different things. Sometimes there's crossover. You have to do registrations. Uh, but the websites themselves are not as intuitive as they could be. So we're working with free minds now, and I'll continue to do that. Um, but you don't have to deal with the websites, really, because they take care of that. You need someone to, re to review the grants. Um, for me, uh, and if you're in a company where uh, you're planning to be successful, I can guarantee you, you're going to be very, very busy. And in this environment, for me, I need to things, have things fed to me. Um, and that's what happens. I get, here's your research strategy, here's the different sections, here's some ideas as, as to how uh, the content should look. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and other things along those lines. So, um, uh, again, um, I'm working now with Free Minds, continue to do that. We plan on filing a number of, of other grants. And uh, just as a final word, you can get these grants. The, the odds, if you have a good idea, are very high. Um, I've been fairly successful in getting these. And I think that, um, that if you, um, if you uh, set uh, your goal to do it and you do it in the right way, you have a good chance. So. 
Um, I hope it's been helpful. Um, we're going to have a panel, and then I'll be around after if there's any uh, questions you want to ask me directly. So thanks. Great. Thank you very much. That was very, very informative. Up next, Dan. Would you like to join us? Great. Thanks. Um, so my story is a little bit different. Um, I. Uh, my background is as a biomedical engineer. I went to, um, I worked at the FDA for a year and then uh, went on and did my internship at the Mayo Clinic and um, uh, started my first company, which was an obesity company, and joined a venture firm right after that for a couple of years, left it to then fo focused on an incubator. And FreeMind is a very, uh, has been an excellent resource for our incubator because we have a bunch of different technologies we're working on that uh, are all over the map and they were able to help us come in, come in and help us form a strategy around how to best uh, tackle the grant process. So um, we have a total of six venture-backed companies that we've spun out or, uh, in the last six years and then we have five others that we're incubating still. The venture-backed companies, um, I list them as venture-backed, but they've been backed by a ton, uh, a whole slew of different uh, mechanisms. So the first company, Baranova, has raised about $50 million total. It's raised um, money from two corporates, Allergan Medical and Boston Scientific. It's raised uh, and money from big venture capital. That was my first deal. And that was, uh, at, at that point I realized it's probably better to avoid the big VC um, where they come in and even if it feels like a friendly takeover, it's a hostile takeover, essentially, from day one. Um, Sequana Medical was my next company. It's a pump for ascites fluid, and it's in Switzerland now. Uh, that company took uh, outside OUS, uh, outside of the U.S. venture capital. Um, no grant money there either. EM Kinetics has taken an investment from a corporate, Allergan Medical, um, a family office, and a group of angel investors. <clears throat> That's still a going concern. Channel Med Systems took in money from family offices, again, Boston Scientific, and um, angel investors as well. And then the last two, um, we uh, ventured out even further and did an equity crowdsourcing deal with an um, equity crowdsourcing platform called Deal Labs, where they solicited accredited investors and we were able to raise uh, $3.9 million. The, reason we were able to raise the $3.9 million, though, is largely because of the grants that we had received. And one thing you'll hear a lot about is the non-dilutive nature of the grants, but there's also a huge boon associated with the validation that comes with these grants as well. We had two phase one SBIR grants at that time. We raised the capital, and at the time we also had a score on a phase two grant for this company called Consano Medical. And that phase two grant is for $1.8 million. We uh, expect a notice of award today or tomorrow or maybe in a year. Actually, probably not a year. Um, but it'll be sometime this month. It's, uh, we applied for it in April, though. So this is the real downside in my mind to um, the grants. If you have any entrepreneurial sense of urgency, it's gonna, you're going to be tearing your hair out. So with at least with the grants, I've learned to be to throw it over the transom, or more than that, I should we form a good grant, and in the case of FreeMind, we've formed some great ones, and then be patient, go about the rest of my business, and not let it be a distraction. Stop checking ERA Commons once a week, just let it kind of stew. But <clears throat> and that's that's my advice. I but using it as a tool, what I've done with the, our incubator is we've used the grants as a tool, not just for the non-dilutive financing, because our my companies are going to need a lot more money than that. Collectively, these venture-backed companies have raised over, I think, about $110 million now. And it's going to be a lot of free mind work to get that amount of money from the government. So, <clears throat> but what I've used them for and have been very successful with so far is as a source of small amount of non-dilutive capital to do the feasibility work and then also the validation associated with having a panel of reviewers as, um, as uh, er erratic as they can be, having a panel of reviewers sit down and look at the grants has been, um, has been a real source of comfort for our investors. As a side, as a side note, too, as a part of getting the second grant, I've um, been invited to sit on a panel to review SBIR grants, and that's also been very informative. 
given me more insight into the whole process. So that's my quick presentation. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with you and share, share our experience. Um, I'm a, a physician and neurologist by training, and, and this company, BioNeur, was creating other developed therapies for multiple sclerosis. This is the, my topic. I have been working uh, for many years. And at a given point, we decided to uh, move to the, in the past to patients uh, um, by creating this company and proceeding to the, from the preclinical and clinical studies. And here I'm going to explain the, this transition also from being a company based in Europe, in Spain, to be a company based in the US as well, and how we are dealing with uh, non dilutive financing. Uh, regarding the, the company the comp uh, and the, pro and the pr uh, project, uh, we are focusing developing uh, therapies, small chemical drugs for this condition, multiple sclerosis and related conditions. And right now we have developed a small molecule which is target this, uh, what is called AJK, it's a, it's a protein which is critical for the survival of neurons. Um, in this process of uh, developing a, this new therapy for this condition, we uh, have been uh, also in, uh, try to be innovative in the, also the clinical development. And in order to do that, we have focus in ophthalmology because uh, this disease also involves the eye, involves the retina, and we have tools for measuring the efficacy of these drugs uh, through the retina. And this also provides uh, some advantages in regarding when we approach BCs, because they love ophthalmology many times, and also when we approach NIH or FDA in other cases, because uh, neuroscience sometimes is very competitive, ophthalmology, retina diseases are something that they really promote a lot. And um, uh, during this period of time, uh, the company was created um, in 2009, and now we are close to uh, start the clinical studies. Uh, this company is a spin-off of uh, two research institutions in Barcelona, and now it's based here in the Silicon Valley, in Melo Park. Um, during this period of time, we have been able to raise uh, five to six uh, million dollars uh, uh, by a combination of uh, investment from mainly business angels, uh, still not a business on the, on the board, um, uh, non dilutive finances, uh, both from our country, Spain, as well as Europe, and now in the US. Uh, in this process of uh, developing this program, um, we, need, we must be innovative because drug development is extremely expensive um, and uh, financing uh, uh, intensive at the financial level. Um, one of the approaches was to request the orphan drug designation by both FDA here and IMA in Europe, which provides some advantages. Of, uh, at many levels in terms of intellectual property, uh, visibility for pharmas, uh, but also at the financing level because they re reduce the regulatory costs as well. Um, okay. Regarding the, the grand strategy, uh, at the beginning the, uh, the company uh, was created in Spain and there the, co the, the country also provides uh, grants. Uh, uh, most of the time, uh, even if they are not dilutive, they are uh, in general more, uh, mainly soft loans that uh, we need to come back with uh, very good uh, conditions. Um, they accept what is called the technical risk. If the project fails, you don't need to come back the money. And this was uh, 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 was very helpful for us at the time of building the project in the, for the first stages. Of the, in order to develop the chemical studies, the, the first proof of concept studies. Uh, in parallel, the European Commission the, also uh, is highly involved in, in promoting collaboration with industry, and right now it's a strong focus, and they always love to have uh, companies involved in European grants. European grants are different to the grants that they are provided for NIH. In general, they are a consortium of 10 uh, academic teams and plus one or two companies. Um, this is uh, non dilutive funding in the sense that they are really grants. They are highly competitive, but in different way. Uh, this is my experience. NIH grants are really focused in science, and European grants are more in, let's call, uh, politics in science, uh, let's say. Um, and you need to fit really well in the call in order to be able to be a guard. Um, we have been uh, uh, 
coordinating one of these uh, international projects. That one of the good things is that provide access to great scientists in all the European academic institutions. That is a way to bring uh, knowledge um, and new ideas to the uh, to the company. Uh, and I, the European Commission have different mechanisms in addition to what is more uh, popular, the European grant, but also the, uh, the what is called the IME, the Initiative of, Med of Medicines, which uh, involve uh, big pharma as well as uh, biotech companies. And then uh, we have the NIH grant that has been explained before. Um, in general, we have always uh, uh, applied with the support of consultants uh, in Spain with local consultants. Here, with, uh, with the help of FreeMind, we can comment then uh, in the panel, which is the advantages. But uh, you know, first, when you are overdone with many things to do, you always any help is welcome. The bureaucracy, the websites, and everything else is, is, is important. You, you need help. I, I used to, to write grants by myself uh, at my academic level. Um, you know, this makes a big difference. And also because they, you receive the feedback, the criticism, um, you know, at the end, must, a grant must be perfect, and it's a way to be perfect. Um, in addition to the NIH, which may be the most popular thing, uh, our first case of success here has been what the, with the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. And this is a kind of uh, what is called venture philanthropies. The, this foundation, Patient Foundation, is interested in curing the patient with the disease and improving the quality of life. And they have realized, they have made analysis years ago, that they have invested a lot of money, maybe $100 million per year in research grants for all the academic institutions. Knowledge about the disease have really moved ahead a lot, but they have not seen really progress in terms of therapy. The, therapy, the therapies we have right now are coming from pharma that has been developed with the, with, without the help. And for the re reason they have created this uh, this fund, the fast forward, which is uh, they use part of the money they they they, they have for for research, but with the, they manage as a VC, as a venture capitalist. But in this case, they are fi finalists in the sense that for them, what is important is not the money coming back as an investor, but having a drug uh, or a project that is moving ahead to the next step with the possibility of uh, providing a new therapy uh, for a given disease. Um, you know, this is a very important. They gave to us a grant which uh, almost one million dollars. Um, negotiation uh, with them was extremely easy. You are used to, to deal with the uh, venture uh, with VCs is really uh, more complex. Here they provide all the facilities in order to go ahead with this grant. Um, of course, they are going to they request some money back, uh, but just um, in very reasonable terms um, in order to have additional money to, for the next project. Regarding the NIH, uh, because we are a, a company that was uh, creating in Europe, in Spain, and now we are in the process of moving here, already uh, working here, but in order to apply to the NCATS, uh, SVR, and all the other pro programs that uh, has been explained before, you must uh, prove that f at least 50% uh, of the of your share are, um, or, or, the, or the money is coming from here, from the US, uh, which uh, we are still not qualify for that. We are in the process, and in the meantime, we have applied to the National Institute of uh, Eyes Diseases to several grants. One is a R01, which is focused in chemistry, uh, in order to develop our backup uh, program. And there, we are going with the uh, collaboration with uh, uh, chemical companies here from Silicon Valley, as well with the uh, uh, academic, academic institutions. Uh, we submit the grant ones, we receive the scores, and now we are resubmitting again. And the quality of the pros, uh, proposal has improved a lot, with, in this case, with the help of, of uh, FreeMind. And the second grant that we have submitted right now, still uh, waiting for the results, is a R21, which is uh, more focused in the uh, proof, proof of concept and mechanism of action uh, of our drug in these conditions. Uh, in both cases, the, the, what is mandatory is to have uh, very good science, very good uh, collaborators. Uh, all times, the officials from the NIH are very helpful, providing feedback, and they are happy to hear that you are collaborating with the, with the researchers and the top academic centers as well. Um, as, as I said before, the SBR um, we are still not qualified, hopefully to be able to qualify along this year. Um, just to summarize, uh, what is the impact for, uh, for our company? Or, uh, 
for us was a key in order to really be able to move this project from the very beginning to the to the situation of being close to submit a INDA and getting approval for clinical studies, meaning that the great thing is, is money. Uh, these days, somebody asked me, uh, uh, this asked me, uh, uh, how do you like to have the investment in dollars or euros? And I say, we, we like to have the, just money, doesn't matter. Uh, and this is again the same, uh, all the money is always very welcome. But uh, in addition, and I think all the other panelists have commented the same thing, is the prestige. We have been evaluated um, by a foundation which is highly uh, recognized and the, panel and, the, and the scientific advisor for our uh, top researchers. Also, when you get a NIH grant, it's the same situation. And this is something that the VCs and all, as well as pharma really appreciate. Also, uh, in this process uh, of uh, preparing the grants, submitting, reviewing, uh, the quality of science improve, and also you get the feedback from the uh, scientists for the, the academic institutions, and also uh, in terms of management, uh, having a, 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 um, during the process of submission, but also during the follow-up, especially with this foundation, in, in the case of the National Medical Society, they really um, are going to work with us uh, as a external managers in order to follow the project, and of course, you have somebody on top of you, but at the same time, this additional pressure is uh, at the end very helpful in order to move forward to the project. Um, just uh, to, summar to finalize, uh, the, what something is important is to start the process uh, just with time enough because uh, otherwise it's, it's difficult um, and talk with the institution uh, to get uh, all the funding agency that you are planning to, to apply. Um, and be realistic in terms of uh, plans and budget. And cross your finger. Thank you. Yeah, so Pablo mentioned uh, euros versus uh, uh, dollars. I would refrain from uh, accepting Russian rubles these days. <laughs> well, yours. Thank you. Hi, my name is Megan Ravel. I'm the Director of Business and Technology Development at NanoMR. And the story that I'm going to tell you today about NanoMR is that of a company that was truly, at the end, at death's door, and then non-dilutive funding brought us back to life. Just to give you a little bit of an introduction, uh, NanoMR is a venture-backed uh, medical device company based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is not necessarily a hotbed of biotech industry, but there's a lot of great science there if there are national labs and the university and our company was based on technology from Sandia National Labs and from UNM. And I think like a lot of startups, where we are today, the, the product we have today looks very little like what we started with, but the vision was always the same. And that was to develop a rapid diagnostic for bloodstream infections. If this is a market you don't know much about, the, the essence of the problem is this, that when a physician suspects you of having a bloodstream infection, they'll take a vial of blood, They'll put it in a nice broth, in a warm incubator, and wait for it to grow, wait for that pathogen to grow up to a level where it can be detected. And that process can take days. And the nature of a bloodstream infection is such that in order to survive, you need to be treated immediately with the right drug. So those drugs exist, but a doctor needs to know what is in your bloodstream to do it right. Is it E. coli? Is it staph? And so that's where we come in. We developed a sample prep system that can pull a pathogen out of blood in real time to be delivered to any of the many molecular ID systems out there for rapid ID, so that a physician can give a patient the appropriate antibiotics or antimicrobial treatment right away. Uh, our financial history, as I said, is uh, based in venture capital. We raised a Series A of approximately 10 million, and with that money, we developed our sample prep system, which it involves magnetic beads, custom antibodies, and a special process to pull out very low concentration targets. In that Series A, we also decided to abandon our development of a detection system because we learned from market feedback there were many good options already out there. And we also started a clinical study that provided great results that enabled us to raise the Series B. With the Series B, we refined our sample prep manual assay, we expanded our clinical trial, and we showed at least proof of principle that this whole process could be automated because 
Even though it works manually, if it's not quick and automated in a box that can fit into a clinical lab, it's meaningless. Um, unfortunately, after the $20 million investment, we did not have a box. So at this point in our development, our investors, as you can imagine, were reluctant to put any more money in, and we didn't have a great story to go out and raise new funds. And so that's when the contract from BARDA that we were eventually awarded uh, was critical, made all the difference. Um, our strategy for non-dilutive funding overall was, it wasn't uh, a focus in our company. Very early on during the Series A, we considered SBIRs. In fact, I have to say we devoted and wasted quite a bit of time working with uh, local scientists to apply for a phase two, only to realize very late in the process that we weren't eligible for it because of the rules around venture-owned companies at that time. It's not an issue anymore. But as we moved on in our development, SBIRs were no longer a good option because they simply didn't provide enough funding to accomplish any of our major goals. So our CEO tasked us with finding a multi-million dollar award that was directly in line with our critical path. And that's really an impossible task. Um, but we worked with a consultant who looked at the entire landscape of opportunities. And this was someone who was able to make introductions for us, which I think was very helpful, and also to explain really just how it worked, who had money and what were they looking for. And that was really important, helped us to streamline our presentation. So then we went out to a few key organizations, agencies, and we made a pitch. Based on those interactions, we narrowed down BARDA as an agency that we should focus on. Um, there were a lot of reasons why it seemed like a great fit. Uh, BARDA is relatively new, and uh, they were just started in 2006, but they're focused on companies like us that are fairly late stage, but are in the valley of death. And what was very important for our application is that BARDA is looking for technologies that aren't just relevant to um, the public health emergencies that BARDA is tasked with dealing with and preventing, but also technologies that can be used in everyday civilian situations. And that's exactly what we had. So the process with BARDA is you can apply for a tech watch meeting, you do that online, you get invited out, you give a presentation to about 12, 15 people, you talk about your uh, technology, and this is not related to any particular solicitation at all, you just tell them what you have, what you can do, and you can get some really great feedback and feel out what their interest is. And based on that initial interaction, we thought we had a really good chance. So um, I, I just put the calendar here so you could see kind of what the process was. We had the meeting. The next month, we read through their solicitations, picked one. We wrote a white paper, submitted that the month after. And then we waited a long time to hear back. Um, this, I'll go into some of the, the issues with that, that waiting that were really critical for us. But eventually, we had the good news that they wanted a full proposal. So at the, the stage where you're submitting a white paper, probably are the chances of this ending in award is something like 5%. When you get invited for a full proposal, it goes up to 25%, maybe 50%, but we were very hopeful. Um, we submitted the full proposal and then received um, an excellent score. And at that stage, when we received our score, we knew our chances were probably 95% of getting the award, which we ultimately did. So the, um, the hurdles and hardships we encountered in this process were largely things that we had no control over. Um, when we submitted that white paper, typically BARDA will get back to you within 90 days. And so with a, as you can imagine, a venture back based board, um, they expected to hear an answer very quickly and started to factor that into their decision making, but this was during the sequestration of 2013, and it didn't happen in that timeline. Um, when they did finally get back to us, which is very exciting, we had a 300-page proposal due in 45 days, and this was from a team that had never done anything like this before, and it was over the U.S. holidays, and it wasn't just a factor of getting my team to be able to produce that proposal in that short amount of time, but we had a lot of subcontractors who had also never done this before. It seemed impossible. And that's when we reached out to FreeMind, and we were very fortunate that they, they took us on, and it made all the difference. So right away, they were able to not only help us put together this proposal, but give us strategic advice through that process. So right away, they said, ask for an extension, which we didn't know we could do, and they told us how to do it and, and how much we could ask for. So we got the extension. And then they gave us the outline for all the work we would have to do to put this proposal together, a timeline for when we need to generate each piece, um, when we would be reviewing it, 
and then through the whole process, just critical feedback that was very helpful and very positive. And ultimately, we submitted the proposal in February of 2014. Then there was another long period of waiting. We were told that if BARDA is interested in your proposal, you'll hear back from them much earlier than in the uh, span of time that they allot, and that turned out to be true. So we heard from them in June with our ranking, and that's when the negotiation started. And of course, that's not really negotiations. It's they ask us questions and we give them answers. It's not a negotiation. And we um, finally signed the contract in September, which is great. And so um, the, only, the only hurdles we had at this stage were that this was also coinciding with Ebola. And BARDA is also tasked with dealing with Ebola. So we were, we were very, very low on the priority list, but had so much to do. So again, there was a lot of waiting and just being understanding that you know, our anthrax detection device wasn't at the top of their list. Ultimately, though, um, what we were awarded was uh, a base period of $6 million. And what this money is enabling us to do is to take our manual assay and automate it. We're going to make our box. We've already started. What BARDA wanted us to do with our assay is to develop some reagents that were specific for anthrax, um, which is very straightforward for us to do, and, and we've, already, we've already accomplished that. At the end of this period, if we meet our milestones, um, BARDA may elect to give us uh, an additional uh, award, option one, which in, would allow us to transfer to manufacturing. That would be able to build up you know, the number of instruments and cartridges we have so that we could go into option two, a $4 million award for an FDA study. And interestingly, at the end of our um, negotiations with BARDA, they said, and can you please add some more money to your budget and put in option three, because if we really like it, we want to do more. And I guess you have to get it all in at the beginning, so we added an option three. If all this looks good, then we'll develop more assays with BARDA. This is a really simple slide to show the impact, and it completely understates the impact. But basically, we're going from this funny lab setup to something real that's going to be FDA cleared and that can be used in clinical labs anywhere. Um, it's compatible with the bloodstream infection assay we developed years ago. It will be compatible with every assay that BARDA asks us to develop going forward. And I can't be too specific. I have to, I can't state um, how, what a strong impact it had on our interactions with ex external parties. Um, it was night and day. Once we got this award, the interactions we were having were so much more meaningful and uh, with the potential of a great impact on NanoMR's future. And all I can say is stay tuned. I, um, there could be exciting news in the future. For pointers and, and keys to our success, I think that what really helped us was that we, with the assistance of a consultant, explored so many different opportunities at the very beginning. It didn't just pigeonhole or, or you know, keep a narrow focus for just one option. Also, having the consultant to make the introductions, I think, was also very important to know what road not to go down, and these people don't have any money, or they're not interested in diagnostics right now. It was very helpful. And then to um, narrow, when we had already done that work, to find the best fit. And BARDA was definitely the best fit in terms of the stage of our technology, uh, what their particular solicitation was looking for, um, that they were looking for dual-use products. It just lined up great. Um, Always treat the sponsor as a customer. As people who are not used to dealing with the government, we kept, we would be puzzled by what we were hearing from BARDA and think that we knew better. But um, our excellent free mind consultant kept reminding us it's a customer and just, you know, give them what they want, answer their question, and that was the right advice. One other thing I thought of um, here on the listening to everyone else's talks is that if you have the choice of subcontractors, try to pick subcontractors who have worked with the government before. That's one battle that we're going to be dealing with through our entire award is dealing with subcontractors who don't have that experience. And lastly, I would just recommend um, that you get help because I think that our assistance with FreeMind made an incredible difference and really made this happen for us. And good luck. Great, so now we'll revert to the panel. Um, so I was listening to all these the four companies, um, trying to see what they all have in common, uh, which coincidentally <laughs> was working with FreeMind, but that's not why we're here. What I really want to try to understand is what is that, people like to call it the secret sauce, I, I don't really like that expression, but 
and kind of philosophical about what wins awards. Dan. Hmm. Is this, uh, how do I do this? Because it's yeah, on. Yeah, it's right? on, yeah. So um, that's, I, I'd gotten a pretty good indication of that in the venture community cons uh, by working in the venture capital firm and raising a lot of venture money. Um, but I, ha I didn't have that in the grant industry. Uh, I'm starting to get that now, now that I've been a reviewer. And I think the, the main thing is uh, I've learned not to submit grants unless they're firing on all cylinders, unless it's a significant technology, that there's innovation, and um, that it's work that we can do that is meaningful but digestible. And if you propose too much, I think you end up getting in trouble. And if you don't propose enough, you get in trouble. Um, and then I would say the last thing is the feasibility data is pretty critical. If you can get good feasibility data to show that essentially you've almost already done what you're going to say, you say you're going to do, then uh, that, that's worked. That those are the grants that we've ended up getting. Mm -hmm. so. um, completely agree. Um, what I will say in addition is to fit the call, meaning um, sometimes the calls are coming with some specifications and it's important to be adapt. Uh, um, also not so you're to referring to responsiveness, being responsive to, to exactly. The, yeah. exactly. Um, second, of course, is the quality of science and the preliminary data, of course, the, the having uh, also strong, good CV supporting the, the application, good institutions supporting the application, um, you know, being balanced between how much to do, how much, how much money you request, something that uh, is uh, uh, well balanced, and finally that the, the niche or the solution you are providing is meaningful at the end. So, Michael, how would you characterize the, your awards? What, what was that extra mile that, that basically brought you over the line um, to, to, to make the award? Um, you know, I, I think there, there's a number of things. Um, one of them that I thought of was um, they like to see some preliminary work. And so, um, you know, typically in, in my circumstances, we had done some work prior to uh, submitting the grant. And the idea there, I mean, and, and you, you could look at this in multiple ways. If you put too much there, they're going to say, well, gee, you don't need a grant. Um, but in, 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 uh, in fact, I think that um, they like to win. So they're like anyone else. They want to fund something where they, they win and the company does well. And so um, what I typically do is put some uh, data in there, preliminary data. Um, but it uh, gives them some uh, confidence that, that we can make it. And th the other thing is, um, and I, I, I mentioned this in, in the talk, that I, I think that, um, that uh, some, some of the success that I've had in getting grants is just in spending a lot of time uh, writing the grant and, um, and making it very clear as to what your value is and not complicated. Um, and, um, and that, of course, assuming that you, you have a good idea to, to start with, because um, I'm sure they screen out quite a few of them, um, you know, initially, because the, the uh, concept is, is not, uh, in their view, viable. Mm -hmm. Great. And now, Megan, you, you touched upon this briefly. Um, you said that there were some introductions made to BARD and other interested parties. Um, how do you feel that uh, the discussion with BARD, uh, how, how much impact did that have, and ultimately, being able to secure that award. I know BARDA came with their, their own uh, agenda, so how did that uh, impact your decision making internally? The, the initial introduction? Uh, initial plus the preparation of the, uh, while, while you're in, in preparing the actual uh, contract for BARDA. Were there any changes made throughout the process? Were, did they come with any suggestions or? They, they did. Um, I mean, I think the initial introduction and exchange was very helpful because we had a sense early on what they had money for. Mm -hmm. And which is not something that you can just glean from, you know, research or, or their solicitations and, and where their key interests were and how we had overlap with that. And, um, and they did give us some feedback through the process, but uh, it was very, very last minute. We had to be nimble. And That's in <laughs> many cases in grant uh, preparation, yeah. uh, the nimbleness. Um, and just to, to pick up on the last thing that you, you mentioned, uh, um, suggesting that we, we remain tuned to, uh, to, to the news, um, 
and I think Michael touched upon this as well a little bit, in the eyes of the investors, and when you're talking to investors being an awardee, um, how does that come up in the conversation? What sort of re responses do you feel you get? Uh, $24 million from BARDA, you know, that's kind of off the charts, it's fantastic. Uh, $150,000 SBIR, how does that, how do the investors relate to, to these, uh, these numbers? Potential investors, yes, to start with you. Um. They were over the moon. Over they the moon. were <laughs> delighted. And it was, I saw someone's slide had, it was a validation for their technology. It was absolutely a validation to our investors and to um, other external parties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Michael, when, when you, uh, you, you talked about valuation and you had your own stepwise approach about grant, series A, grant, et cetera, um, your gut feeling, I know it's, it's a little hard, but your yeah. gut feeling as to the actual numbers. So, let's say it's a quarter million SBIR, what does that do to the valuation? Ram in his presentation talked about an eight year uh, lag to get you uh, an 8x return. But in the short term, what is your gut feeling that, uh, that such a grant would, uh, would provide to the valuation? Um, well, you know, I can, I can um, tell, tell you what, what we experienced uh, just recently. And um, so in, in the grant, uh, for us, because a phase one in, in the bigger picture is not, not a lot of money. Um, but um, in, in our, our uh, Series A financing, which was tough because it's hard to get money for early stage medical devices, uh, it was certainly something that we talked about and it was, it was more uh, related to the uh, review process and uh, the credibility associated with that. But it, I think it also depends on the target, your target investors. Uh, if you go after VCs that are deep pocketed, a grant is not, is not going to be that big of a deal. But in, in our case, we were not focusing on deep pocketed VCs. And to them, even the, you know, the $250,000 makes a lot of difference because they're very vulnerable to, uh, to dilution. So, and as I mentioned, I think, um, that uh, initially when, we, when I um, had the investors for the Series, um, the series A, um, they offered a valuation and ended up getting two times that. And certainly was selling the grant and some other things, but it certainly, and that's why I said, I think we made more uh, in, um, in uh, uh, avoiding some dilution uh, based on the grant than, than the uh, 225,000 that we received. Fantastic. Um, Bionur is a Spanish company, uh, after all. Um, you know, I personally uh, uh, speak to many European companies, and uh, the first uh, response is, really? We, we can win U.S. awards? And they're always very, very surprised. And uh, I was really looking to you to, to see what, what sort of reactions uh, do you feel you got from, from the grant you submitted? Uh, is being a Spanish company right now moving to the U.S., granted, um, does that affect, do you feel that affects uh, the, the final product you're able to put forward and how it's, how it's accepted? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, at the beginning, uh, it was familiar that it was possible, but, you know, until really try and getting it's, it's something that you cannot really grasp in, in detail. But, uh, you know, uh, after uh, having this uh, first uh, success with this uh, uh, multiple success foundation was uh, for us very important in order to get credibility in, in front of the VCs, uh, also for the farmers, all the farmers collaborate, all the farmers working in this uh, disease also collaborate with the foundation, meaning that it's, uh, it's altogether it's a process that really um, help in the, in the way of uh, making the project more appealing for the next round of investment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dan, being a reviewer <laughs> now, um, how many grants do you read as a reviewer? I'm just curious. <laughs> so it, it, it's a seven each cycle, and then it's a, a mix of the phase two and the phase ones. So I have three phase twos and four phase ones, and I am reviewer one on three of them. And what differentiates them? Uh, I'm sure they, they don't score all the same. Some are better, some are not as good. Right. Uh, what ticks you off? What, what do you like in a grant when you read it? Um, I like to see that they are on a path towards commercialization. Um, I happen to get two grants from one group um, <laughs> in the same review uh, panel. 
and they listed their uh, exploits, and one of them was that they had raised $42 million from the government in grants. Um, they'd raised 700000 in private capital and didn't have a product on the market. Hmm. So I just gave them uh, eights across the board. Really? Yeah. How was the science, though? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. The science was bad, too. It, it was well, good. Four, it was a force-actuated epidural needle, which would take away the pop to let you know that you're in the epidural space, which you need to know when you're doing a right. spinal tap. Yeah, that, that. So it just didn't make sense either. Hmm. <laughs> Very good. I think we can also take some uh, questions from the audience. I think. Yes, please. So um, unfortunately, as uh, Michael alluded to, this is sort of a death valley for medical devices right now. So I haven't, I haven't seen a big uptick in valuations, but I've been able to get deals done, which is the coup in this case, and at decent valuations. Um, my typical valuation for a Series A company is anywhere from four to five million. And this last company was around a six million, it was a six million pre-money, and that was because of the grant. So it was a slight tick uptick, and we raised four million, which became a big difference once you added in the option pool. It was the difference between keeping and giving away control of the company. So it was meaningful. More questions? Yes. Yeah, the, the panel gives some great examples of what's needed for, for grants. I've gotten a number as well. I had a couple of things I wanted to add to build on top of what they said. Real short. Uh, one of the things I didn't hear was that to be successful getting a grant, um, one of the biggest things that I've found is your PI and your PD. Mm -hmm. you, you really need to have your, uh, uh, your principal investigator and or your PD be significant, have patents, have PhD, be experts in the field, have a really great track record. Don't True. even think of trying to water that down or fake that. I think you probably have found that all to be important as well. Um, and, and and, and the others were asked about um, being an awardee, how important was that to VCs and angels? What I found with every angel and VC I've ever met or dealt with, that one of the first questions, first, second, or third question they'll have is about, have you pursued non-dilutive funding? Yeah, I'm kidding. Anytime I've said no, I've seen the lights turn off. I've seen the lights turn off. So, and, and what I found with that, if, if people don't want to spend all the administrative time putting it together, you know, how is it, how are you going to prove that you've got the, 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 the chutzpah and the guts and the, the background to really do what the VC? Because the due diligence is going to be tons of administrative crap as well. So I, I found that what you need to do to put for a grant uh, really builds your muscle, gets you strong, and gets you ready for the next step. You guys mm -hmm. feel the same way? Yeah. How many hours uh, do you think you, you would invest uh, over the course of the year for, for a non-dilutive funding campaign? Uh, Dan, I, I suspect for you it's a little more because you have quite a few uh, companies going on there. Um, yeah, um, so it's about not taking into account the hours required to generate the feasibility data, which I think are required to make right. it successful. Um, it's anywhere from 60 to 80 hours, it would seem, to write the grant, polish it, make sure you've got all the sections correct and submit. It was significantly less with FreeMind. I think we we ended up uh, 20 to 30 hours of reviewing and writing. So, great. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say that in terms of planning, more or less, you need to go a full month with a team, uh, not not just fully dedicated to that, but really commit to that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Even one month is not maybe not enough. Sure. Michael, in your, in your uh, operations, how, how much time do you invest over the course of the year? Grant preparation? Well, I mean, grant uh, preparation is, um, um, you know, it, it goes over for us a couple month period prior to filing the grant. And then so it's very intense during, during those times. Um, what we found in this, this STTR is we wrote the grant, maybe we spent a little bit more time uh, then, then um, 
than uh, was mentioned. Um, but where I really spend the time was after we got put in the final group, and then all of a sudden we had to get all these contracts in, in the very short periods of time. It, it was crazy. It, it was, when I first looked at it, it was not possible. How do you, how do you negotiate with the University of California, San Diego in a week and get a contract? That, that was what, was what we did. And there were you know, three or four or five other things that were just like that. So, so it is intense, mm -hmm. and probably two, two times. One when you're riding it, another time um, at some point when you're, you're in the final, the finals. And Megan, how hard did you guys work for your $20 million? <laughs> I'm afraid to say how much time we put into it. We're probably not an example of the most efficient approach, but um, the white paper was not a big deal. The proposal was my full-time job for four months. <laughs> and then during negotiations, Barter with my boyfriend, and whenever they emailed, I was on it. I called them back, and it's still like that today. It's just full time. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, we're, we're very close to the end now. Uh, so the real last, final, absolute one sentence words of wisdom. Uh, we'll go through the, the panel, and, and we'll conclude. Words of wisdom. One sentence. Just <laughs> whoever wants to go first, let's yeah, yeah. go first. One last piece of. Your ultimate piece of advice. Hmm. I'll go first. Yes. I expect success. Plan oh, that you, it will be successful. That's nice. That's nice. Right. Yeah, I think so too. That that um, you can get these. Um, um, I think the odds are equal to or better than getting equity financing. So it, so it is worth it in some cases. I mean. If you're raising $50 million, it, it may not be, but in a case um, uh, where uh, you're trying to get a company off the ground, it, it's, it's definitely, a, um, I think, a good option. Uh, but, but again, write, write a good grant, very clear. Mm -hmm. Pablo, yeah. last words of wisdom. Yeah, again, it's a good science, um, planning in advance, uh, preliminary data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I mean, this is a little bit free mind serving, but I would say get help. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what my, my piece of uh, uh, wisdom uh, would be. Uh, to date, we have yet to identify a single grant that was awarded that was not submitted. Submit, 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 and you'll win. <laughs> With that, we conclude. Thank you very much.